We're looking ahead today on Fixing the Money Thing. But let me say this, the promise has within it all of the DNA needed to produce the mature fulfillment of the promise. You've been given the promises. This changes everything. Gary helps you contend for the future as he continues his kingdom teaching established now on Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, I want my people free. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. You'll never find your destiny until you fix the money thing. Gary concludes his Contend for the Future established message now on Fixing the Money Thing. All right, let's go over to Galatians chapter four. Now, verse one of chapter four of Galatians, Paul is teaching, he's, um, there's people in this church that are still trying to mix Judaism or the law with the freedom we have in Christ, and he's trying to correct this. So in verse one, what I'm saying is this. As long as the heir is a child, he is no different than a slave. Now, this is how the church lives. They live as slaves, although they're not a slave. They live like it, though. Although he owns the whole what? So the child owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Now, the law was to confine men into righteousness. In other words, they, we didn't have the power to live righteously free from sin before Jesus. So the law was written to confine us through fear, to, confine our, to, to be confined to righteousness so that God could bless us. But now when Jesus came, of course, we're set free from that. The Bible says that sin nature has been circumcised or cut out of us. We don't have a natural desire to sin anymore. New nature in us. All things are new, the Bible says. So he's correcting this. So he's subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons, sonship, because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son and daughter. And since you are sons and daughters, God has made you also an heir. Now, I did a series on inheritance. An inheritance you don't pay for. You enjoy it. You're no longer a slave. Let me say it. Just say it with me. Say, I'm not a slave. I'm a son and daughter of the house. I have a legal claim on this. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing but in all things through prayer and supplication. Or most, I like the version to say petition. Prayer and petition. Let your requests be known to God with thanksgiving. And then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It is not talking about asking, may I? It's asking through petition. Meaning that you already have a right to it. You're making a requisition. You're making a requisition. Pass the potatoes. Pass the bread. In fact, Jesus said healing is the children's bread. Pass the bread. See, you already have the legal right to it. It's already yours. You have the whole estate. We just read that. The child had a, had a legal right to the estate. When they be, grew up and became a son and daughter, they have the inheritance of what? The entire estate, correct? Is that what it said? Yes. There's nothing left. The entire estate. It's already yours. So when you make a petition, you are making a legal claim on it. You're not begging for it or asking for it. Let's get this straight. Your prayers should not sound like begging. That's unbelief and lack of knowledge. 
when you ask God, you need to make sure that you understand your legal right to what's going on, right? The Bible says this is our confidence. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. If we know that he hears us, we know we have those things we've asked of him. That's an absolute. Not maybe, I hope it happens. No, that is going to happen. And I'm so sure about it, I'm going to walk like I already have it. That's what that looks like. But that's not how I was taught growing up. How about you? Never, never even heard such a thing. This is a legal issue. You have everything. There are processes you have to learn to enact and to bring that into the earth realm. All right, let's take a look over here at the further in this chapter of chapter 4. Again, now Paul is trying to help these people that are holding to the law that they don't have to, they don't want to, and he tries to explain it to them. Verse 21, tell me, you who want to stay under the law, are you not aware what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. That's Hagar and Sarah. His son by the slave woman was born in the what? Ordinary way. But his son by the free woman was born as what? Result of a promise. Now this, man, if, if, if the bells aren't ringing right now, they're not going to come on, man. Man, this is like, this is a game changer. I mean, this is, this, is, this is your game changer right here, this phrase. The ordinary way, the painful toil and sweat way. Or having a baby the normal way, husband and wife, nine months, Okay, the process, the, the ordinary way. Now, he says that Isaac was not born that way. He was born as a result of a promise. Because Sarah could not have children. Remember? Is that right? The Bible says Sarah could not have kids. So you need to tell me how he showed up. And if you can't tell me how he showed up, it's not going to show up for you either. How did he show up? The Bible says Abraham, though he knew the facts, was persuaded that God had the power to do what he said. What God said was a promise. He didn't have Isaac when he had the promise. He just had the promise. But let me say this. The promise has within it all of the DNA needed to produce the mature fulfillment of the promise. So you're sitting here going, man, I don't know. I can't see myself out of debt. I don't know how to do that, obviously, or you wouldn't be in debt. But the good news is you don't have to know that right now. You just have to find a promise. Because if you allow the promise to incubate in your spirit as truth and allow it to change you on the inside all by itself. That seed within itself has all of the DNA and the plan and the place where you'll get out of debt. Now that's a game changer. The power of the seed is not in the dirt where you plant it. That's you. The seed itself has the plan. A plant's DNA dictates what it looks like when it's grown. The plant's DNA does. The seed itself says, grow here, this kind of leaf, this is what the leaf looks like, this is what the bark looks like, this is what the fruit looks like. This is there. The seed itself has all that instruction in it. Not the dirt. And we sit here and think, well, I got to figure this out. You couldn't figure it out. You've already tried to figure it out. You can't figure it out. The system is geared against you. Have you ever figured it out? The earth curse system, you can't win it. Hardly. It's hard. Some people do, but it's rare. I mean, if I got 65% of the people that have given up on finances and 63% living paycheck to paycheck, it must be pretty hard to overcome that thing. You need the seed. Isaac was born as a result of a promise. Remember that? You leave church, you don't remember anything else I said. Your future is going to be birthed by the seed you incubate. That's why the enemy throws out his seed, tries to capture your imagination. He knows how it works. All right. Are you getting this? All right. So there are two covenants, right? It says this in verse 24. These things, 
the ordinary way or the slow way, and the promise way. These two things may be taken figuratively. Figuratively means a picture, right? It's a figure. It's a picture. For the women represent two covenants, two covenants, Old Testament, New Testament. Now, the result of this new covenant, verse 27, for it is written, be glad, O barren woman who bears no children, break forth and cry aloud, you have no labor pains because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now, right there, your brain should tilt. It's like, huh? How is that possible, right? Well, let's find out. This is a quote out of Isaiah 50, 55, 54. So let's go back and look at it. What's he talking about? We've, again, we've taught this before, but it's such a valuable lesson, such a valuable understanding of what you have your hands on. So 53 is a very famous chapter. It's prophetic about Jesus, right? All 53 is prophetically speaking of Jesus coming and the last sentence of 53 says, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, there's, in the original text, there's no chapter breaks or verse numbers. So the next sentence after that, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor, that's Jesus, single barren woman, right into that, single barren woman, you who have never born a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. How is that going to be possible? What did, what did Jesus bring into the earth realm? Being born again. This is prophetically talking about Jesus, and now we are birthed into the family of God. We're born again through what Jesus did, and because of that, we step into a new covenant, a new beginning, everything changes. And so then it begins to explain what changed. Because of this new covenant, it says in verse 2, which I've written many times taught on this, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back. I love that phrase. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you're going to spread out to the right, to the left, your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of the debt you now have. I put that in there. <laughs> this thing changed everything. It's now not tied to the natural order of things, the ordinary way. It's now tied to the supernatural. And because of that, he's saying, you better prepare for this harvest because it's all changed. Peter, James, and John could fished all night, caught nothing, two boats sinking, five loaves and two fish feed almost 20,000 people. So you've got to start thinking like that. The supernatural, see, this thing changes everything. Now, let me ask you, who, who controls this? If Isaac was born by a promise, who controlled, I, who, who brought, they had to believe that. See, what you believe, what you say is going to dictate what shows up. You've been given the promises. This changes everything. Luke chapter 12, let's look over there. Now, this whole chapter of chapter 12 is talking about not worrying about things and food and clothing, right? So what does it say? Does it say, just stop worrying. There, we fixed that. No, 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 no. See, until you replace one system with another system, nothing changes. You've got to change allegiance, change systems, change how you think, tap into different laws. So you've got to change. The old way is always going to produce bondage. All right. Luke chapter 12, verse 30. For the unbeliever, the pagan, runs after all such things. Painful toil and sweat. You've all tried it. By the way, how fast can you run? 
Really? I mean, we, you think that way, right? I can run harder. I can, I can, get, I can make this work. Just, just more painful toil and sweat. Nice try. For most, that's not possible. For the pagan world runs after all such things. Your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom. He didn't say seek God. He says God knows. He didn't say seek God. Seek the kingdom. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the what? The what? Give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Now, you may read that and say, well, see right there, God says, sell everything I have. Oh, no, no, that's not what he's saying. In the earth curse system, your confidence is in what you have. It's what you possess, and that's what you hold on to. That's my security. He's saying, no, provide purses for yourself. He's not against you having things. He's trying to change your allegiance to which system that you're going to draw from. He's trying to say, look, where you're, what your heart confidently trusts in is where, you know, your, where your treasure's at. We got to change that because we got a treasure that's inexhaustible we need to tap into. So learn how it works. Don't idolize, don't hoard. I mean, you know, it's like this. If a farmer had a whole bin of seed and he's starving, and he says, hey, man, check this out. This is the most awesome bin of seed I got. I mean, there must be like, you know, 100, 100, 100 tons of wheat in that thing, man. It's amazing. Yet they're starving. What would you think? You're a dumb farmer. <laughs> <laughs> but see, once you learn how it works, a farmer, once he learns how the laws work, he's looking for seed to plant. Am I right? See, his whole thinking changes. It's no more, you know, this is my security. You know, we got this grain. Of, it's going to feed us for at least six months. Oh, no, he's thinking in terms of longevity. He's thinking, wait a minute, this is awesome. I got this seed, and I'm going to throw it in the dirt. It'll last me forever. So he's trying to change their thinking about what they hold to. So, you know, I sow my seed for deer every year, Right? If you're new, I, I hunt deer, but I don't really, I receive deer for 35 years, whatever. God taught me how the kingdom works through deer hunting. He'll teach you any way you can get your attention. He'll teach you. So I learned a long time ago, if I sow my seed and declare with my wife that I receive when I sow, bingo, the deer doesn't have a choice. It comes to me. Crazy story. So is still in two boats about sinking. So is bread multiplying, feed 20. It's all crazy stuff, right? Lazarus coming out of the grave. You got to think different. So anyway, this past week, I sowed my seed for in Knox County where I live, you can get three deer. So I sowed because it's three month season for bow hunting. So, you know, I sowed my seed once. And if I want to go out and get one, I'll go out and get one. And I still have seed in the ground. I'll get the other one. So I, I, I sowed for an eight point buck or bigger. You can get one buck, only one buck. Then secondly, I sewed for a button buck. A button buck's a young buck, but they count it as a doe, not a buck. So I'm trying to reduce the does I take out. I want to keep them around. But the last one I did sew for a doe. So I went out. My bow broke. My crossbow broke. I had to borrow one. There's no excuse, but I'm trying to make one. <laughs> that I missed the eight point. He came right along. Nice eight point. Missed it. About 20 minutes later, here comes the button buck. I grazed him. There he goes. In about 15 minutes, here comes the doe and just stands there. Like, get it over with. Come on. <laughs> and I decided, nah, I was already so discouraged about the first two. I said, no, nah, I'll just let you live. I'll go back out. The next day, we're at the house, and Dawson, that's Amy's son, led worship, Amy's son, nine year old, is at the house. And uh, we were kind of just, you know, he's there and visiting, and we were debating, should we take him on home to Amy's house, you know, and what he came for is now finished. And Trina said, no, you know, why don't you take him out hunting? You know, Tim, that's our son, he got his first deer when he's nine years old. Dawson's nine years old. Why don't you take him deer hunting? Okay. 
Now, Dawson's never shot a crossbow before, never been deer hunting before. He's nine. <laughs> Bow hunting, you got to get close. He's nine. He's a boy. I'm trying to say, he's not quiet. <laughs> he doesn't sit still. Okay, you follow, you follow the drift there. All right. So, okay, we'll do this. So I took him out, and he, he handled the, uh, the crossbow. Got, you know, pretty, pretty good, pretty decent with it at uh, 15 yards. You know, he said, okay. So we went out there, and in probably 15 minutes, maybe 20 at the most, here comes this nice six-point trotting up the hill right in front of him. And he's nine. He, he nicked it. He, he missed it. Oh, I forgot that. Thank you. Before we went out, I said, now, Dawson, how are we going to get the deer? Let me tell you, Grandpa doesn't hunt deer. He receives them. And so we got to sow our seed. So we went online. We sowed our seed. I said, now, Dawson, the deer are going to come, you know. They're going to come because we're sowing a seed. God's going to bring it. They're going to come to us. And uh, I added a few extra deer in that seed. It wasn't one deer. I think I named all various types. Thank you for the buck, the button, buck, the doe. Because I didn't care what it was. I'm sure he didn't care what it was, as long as it's a deer. And I just like, I figure he's nine, right? I mean, he may spook one of them. I mean, he's nine, right? I mean, I need, you know. So he, 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 he nicked the, the nice six point. But he did, he did, I couldn't tell exactly where he hit it at. So you only get one buck. So I knew we couldn't shoot another buck until I had time to find to see if this thing was hit or not. So a few minutes later, here comes a button buck, and he got it perfectly, and um, he got his deer. And he's, he's excited about it. There's his deer. Good job, Dawson. Yeah. But here's the point I want to make. He will never forget that as long as he lives. What he's going to remember most, because I asked him, son, Dawson, how did you get the deer? Faith works every time, he said. See, what, he, what he's not going to forget, to, now let me say it this way. He thinks deer hunting is like the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> you just go sit down, they come out in front of you, you shoot them and put them in the freezer. That's, that's easy. <laughs> that's easy to him. And it should be. It's like healing. Oh, that should be easy. You see, that's easy. See, he, he'll never forget that. The laws of the kingdom, though, see. God gave, see, well, the people, well Pastor Gary, that's your grandson. You're his pastor. I mean, I mean, he believes what you say. I hope so. What happened if the deer didn't show up? Never crossed my mind. I have faith for that. Didn't cross my mind. So to him, what I did with Tim, our, our oldest son, he got his at nine, same thing, let's sow our seed together. He got his little dollar bill of his, his bank, you know, and we laid hands on it and sowed it. And that seven-point buck he got, uh, he had a plaque that he made without me saying it. Faith works every time. And he put it on his wall. And I knew that from then on in his life, as he faces different difficulties, he can look at that deer and remember how the kingdom operates. Don't have to be afraid. No, I don't have to be afraid. The kingdom has answers. It works every time. And so I'm sure he's looked at that many times. But see, examples and evidence. You want to raise your kids? Show them evidence. There's no place that has that. There's no place they can go that'll match that. Nothing out there that'll lure them when they understand they have it all.